skateboards, am I right? As a college student, I've been very well acquainted with the idea that skateboards are bafflingly still a thing. I was sure they had died with disco and mumps, so color me shocked. Skateboarding is something that even if you don't understand it, there's a silent respect for it. To dedicate yourself to something like skateboarding takes such perfect control over your own movements and body that it's admirable no matter how loud your shirt is. Seriously though, there's a trick called a dark side and it's like they flip the board onto the black bit there and then they skate on that and then they flip the board back. How do you, how do you even do something like that? Seriously people, call your congressman, I wanna know about this. Contrary to popular belief, skateboarding existed before 1999, but skateboarding's real surge of popularity in the 90s falls on the shoulders of one man and one man alone, Tony Hawk. The Faceless One is one of the most famous athletes of all time, if not the most influential. When I was younger, no one said they wanted to be a football player because of Vince Young. They didn't want to play hockey because of Wayne Gretzky, and they didn't want to play Yu-Gi-Oh! because they weren't me. However, if you asked skaters what made them want to pick up the board, two words. Hate. Dad. And then two more words. Tony. Hawk. Genuinely, I don't think the sport would be close to where it is without a figurehead like Tony Hawk. For all intents and purposes, the man and skateboarding are one and the same. So what better way to shake off a little video rust than by taking a deep dive into the most skateboardingest game ever made? Tony Hawk's Underground. Or Thug as people cooler than me call it. So this game is the child of longtime series Daddy Neversoft and actually came out at a pretty interesting time in culture. The 90s had started off as the neon-soaked flesh spawn of the 80s, and had matured into its own beast by the turn of the millennium. Counterculture was getting even more counter to the point that gross out and recklessness kind of overtook the actual allure of skateboarding itself. You can see pretty clearly in this game, and especially its sequel, that that paradigm shift has happened. Other things that were changing was that Tony Hawk's Pro Skater wasn't just a game for hardcore skaters anymore. It had become a tentpole franchise for the fifth generation of consoles. Mario, Sonic, Crash, Tony, the Four Musketeers! So now that more people were entering the franchise for the first time with each and every entry, difficulty was getting a little bit out of hand compounding all those features. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 was grilled pretty hard for the fact that it was very unwelcoming to new players. As such, new options were added in the name of player accessibility for this game. A difficulty option was added for the first time ever. You could now get off your board, which Tony Hawk cites as the moment when the franchise started to take a nosedive, and for the first time ever, there would be a story mode. A story crafted by skating fans for skating fans. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in this video. So the story starts... Uh, <laughs> Oh, where are my manners? Uh, it's kind of rude to just drop you into the middle of the story without any background. So, uh, let's take it back to the beginning and, uh, go from the start of the Tony Hawk story. In the beginning, there was a vacuum. We're not really sure what filled this vacuum, whether it be darkness, creatures beyond our comprehension, or an exact copy of our universe far advanced from where we are now, but whatever it was was burned away with the Big Bang. With that, life itself slowly began to form. For all that we know, the epicenter of life in the universe is focused here on planet Earth. That'll be the focus for now. On Earth, there is a resource, one that controls everything. It's hardly something tangible that you could hold, but when you have it, you feel it. And more importantly, everyone around you can feel it as well. It's a status symbol, power source, and badge of honor all in one. Points. This is what keeps Earth spinning. This is what makes life worth living. However, there was a problem. Humans in their small mindedness believed that there was only a finite amount of points in the universe. I mean, the Big Bang, the thing that we just discussed, the thing responsible for all matter in the universe. Look at your hands, look at your desk, look at the device you're watching this on right now. Everything was created by the Big Bang, and even then, it was 100 points, max. Some of the greatest figures throughout history have accomplished goals worthy of points, not even breaking the double digits. The construction of the Great Wall of China, nine points. Nero burning Rome to the ground as he fiddled was pretty sick, so he got at least like 16 points. Humans leaving the boundaries of our beautiful planet and piercing the atmosphere into space. 21 points. Mansa Musa, the richest man of all time with an estimated wealth of over $400 billion, is claimed to have said, the one thing I could never possess with my vast wealth was one thing, the one thing that I truly wanted out of life. All the points in the world. 
he said in his native Songhai. It seemed that much like the volatile nuclear energy, while there were ways to harvest points, the cost of doing so was far too great for any nation, let alone single man to attempt. What was interesting was that tying humans back to their primal origins, animals too seemed to be aware of the concept of points, and maybe even possess them themselves. We can observe this in creatures like the Horn Lizard's blood defense system, which was pretty nasty and might have even earned the lizard a point for its boldness. The paradise flying snake of Indonesia, breaking the boundaries of its species and flying like a hawk, was a two-point endeavor. And perhaps the discovery of fire by primitive man earned them enough points to reach Avalon and become uncontested atop the throne of planet Earth. But for all of man's accomplishments, the generation of points seemed to be outside of his grasp for anything other than the greatest of accomplishments. And that's not even discussing what lost humanity points as well. For as easily as points can be earned, they can be taken away in a process dubbed by various religious organizations as bailing. The horrors of pollution, minus 15 points. Man's inhumanity towards man, minus 20 points. Calling Yu-Gi-Oh gay, minus like 100 points because it's not gay, Jerome, you're gay! Humanity could thrive perfectly fine without points, but that's not humanity's way. If there's a boundary, isn't it our duty to cross it in the name of advancement of all that it is to be human? However, the mass generation of points was considered alchemy. Creating something from nothing without a way to offset the cost of creating it was deemed inefficient. And so, for many years, points laid dormant. May 12th, 1968. Nancy and Frank Hawk sired the fourth of four children, preceded by his sisters Pat and Lenore, and brother Stephen, Tony of the Hawk is born into this world. Upon setting their gaze onto their newborn child, their parents were positive they were familiar, but couldn't quite place where they had seen him before. In his youth in San Diego, California, the young Tony was a gifted, if very hyperactive child. With an IQ of 144, Tony was granted many opportunities to display his knowledge at the Gene Farb Middle School, where he was placed in advanced classes. By the age of 14, though, an invisible force had begun to act upon Tony of the Hawk. He was drawn to a sport, something odd for a child of his intellect, but a chance to burn off that energy was one his parents encouraged. After graduating from Torrey Pines High School in 1968, whose mascot is a hawk, because fuck you, Tony found inspiration in one Steve Caballero. While Tony was still young, Steve had already been heralded as the greatest skateboarder of all time. This man invented front side board slide. Grinding! You're welcome, Sonic! Tony unknowingly was about to set forward a revolution, as with his first trick, something unseen had been discovered, the missing piece to an equation that he was completely unaware of. He had earned points. 360 nose bone, 930 points. Switch tail grab, 315 points. A switch 900, 8,000 points. This surge of power did not go unnoticed by the young hawk. Suddenly, he had detained what armies, nations, and the most powerful men of all time fell short of. By the time Tony was a senior in high school, still in his primordial state, Tony was able to buy his own house thanks to the power that the points granted him. To say, however, that Tony's battle was purely a physical one would be to misunderstand who we are talking about. Yes, Tony is an extremely accomplished athlete, yet at the same time, he is also an intellectual. And being the intellectual that he was, Tony began to study the point how they worked, and how they interacted with the world around him. By tricking in the vicinity of certain objects, points could be added. Chaining tricks would multiply points exponentially, and objects once deemed worthless, like VHS tapes and the floating letters that just kind of happened to be all over the place that spelled out the word steak, actually spelled out the word skate. In 1999, Tony realized the dream that so many had fallen short of, inventing and perfecting the 900 degree spin, achieving infinite rotation. There's a concept known as the golden ratio, a beautiful number found in all facets of life, architecture, science, art, even life itself adheres to this number. After Tony's trick, it was discovered that this rotation was actually the trajectory of a 900 degree spin, and Tony with his Mensa level intellect was able to apply that power to his board. With this, Tony became something much more than human. To everybody around him, Tony was to be venerated. He was not just Tony Hawk, pro skater. It was Tony Hawk's pro skater.
This transcendent event was one that shifted the world as we know it. Suddenly, the generation of near-infinite points created a gold rush the likes of which had not been seen since the last one. Now others were finding their own way to shoot past what was considered possible in the realm of skateboarding. Deities such as Mark Gonzalez, a person born within the same month as Tony of the Hawk, Rodney Mullen, who is said to have honed skateboarding to a razor's edge in terms of skill, and Rob Dyrdek, who's a poser, sellout, loser, and should die. Someone who is a prime example of using points as a vehicle to launch oneself instead of skateboarding as a whole. Tony eventually grew aware of these men who skated where he once scooted. He decided that now was the time to create something larger than himself, a group that he could call his own. They were good, but fractured. If Tony could create a skateboarding inner circle, there's no telling what they could do for the world. Tony of the Hawk, Chad Muska, Kareem Campbell, Bob Burnquist, Jamie Thompson, Andrew Reynolds, Alyssa Streamer, Jeff Rowley, Bucky Lasik, and the improbably named Rune Glyphberg formed the original Band of the Hawk. These 10 skaters ushered in a new era, one that the history books refer to as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1. With their combined prowess, points flowed forward from their boards like glorious sugar water. Prosperity was brought to what was originally assumed to be a doomed timeline. The video game Chrono Trigger predicted that the world would fall to ruin by the hands of Lavos in 1999. But it's now very clear to see that thanks to Tony doing an ollie, Lavos was beaten back and the game is now largely considered pointless and completely worthless. These 10 titans would serve as what all others in the field of sports would chase after for years to come. Matt Hoffman, Dave Mira, Kelly Slater, Sean Palmer, even those who did not spend their whole sport standing still, like Brian Lara and Hulk Hogan all were able to accrue points through their own methods. Although, this did result in the first case of points being mentioned in a divorce proceeding when Hulk Hogan and his wife Linda split in 2009. Even those who did not interact with the sport directly, but merely possessed a spirit that embodied the sport, were able to achieve the lofty heights that Tony did, like Dick Vitale. It was becoming clear that not just skateboarding was capable of intense point generation, as sports at large were capable of such a feat. The peak of human athleticism was what was needed to hone one's body for one purpose and one purpose only, victory. In many ways, Tony stood in defiance of the further wave of those emulating his accomplishments, but where he contrasted the greatest was in his outlook on life. Those who were only in the rat race for fame and fortune were doomed to burn out. Tony, however, managed to stay true to himself. He wasn't some poser who sought out a television deal or fame beyond his means. Tony instead kept in his realm. In his vast pools of humbleness, Tony of the Hawk saw himself as a skateboarder. He dealt in skateboards. He lived for skateboarding, but in what some may see as a cowardly move, he chose not to die for it. In the era of Pro Skater 1, Tony of the Hawk chose to retire from professional level skating events of which he had reigned as champion for over 12 years. Tony's absence at the peak of skateboarding caused a cataclysmic shift. While the lord of the board had not given up his life's work, he had opened a vacuum at the peak of the sport for anybody to fill. In this world, iron sharpens iron, and the race to become number one and surpass the hawk was on. Tony, however, saw his purpose elsewhere. He wanted to make the world a better place, so that when the next Tony of the Hawk appeared, he would leave a better world than the one that he found. This led him and his band of the Hawk on a journey, in the era referred to as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. In his journeys, his band grew with the addition of standouts Eric Costin and Rodney Mullen, as well as finally being accompanied by his idol, Steve Caballero. At some point, he also recruited Spider-Man and the Korean pop group Finn KL, which the tomes don't really discuss at length, so it could just be folklore like Paul Bunyan or something. This was considered by critics of the time to be the Golden Age, a time unmatched by any other. Skateboards were flying off the shelves. People were so filled with joy. Life was good. But surely, happiness can't last forever. For every force in the universe, there is an equal yet opposite force acting to balance it. Does this apply to Tony, however? Has the universe ever prepared for something like Tony of the Hawk to exist? Humanity would receive a grim reminder of this universal law on September 28th, 1979. We did not know it at the time, but a bomb was planted that would one day tear down the world with nothing else but his own two hands.
Bam Margera. To some known as the skateboarder on that TV show where Travis Touchdown got his nipple bitten by a baby alligator and there was a little person bar fight. To those that bear the weight of truth, Bam is everything we work not to become. Unlike Tony, who we have extensive knowledge of his early life, Bam is comparatively a complete enigma. We know of his parents and his brothers, we even know the origins of his name, which are derived from the character Bam Bam of the Flintstones, thanks to his compulsion to run into walls as a child. After dropping out of high school, that's where Bam's origins end. However, it's important to realize that quantifying who Bam is isn't even on the list of things you need to know to understand our story. Bam and Tony are linked. The sooner you come to terms with that, the easier your life's gonna be. I'm not saying by any blood relation, but instead by a concept that exists called a tether. This is a force that can be created, but also happens naturally. A tether can form between the best of friends or complete strangers. And when it does, no matter what the relationship was, the two are then put on a crash course of conflict of some sort. It is fated to happen and no force is able to interrupt it. This is not the only way that Tony and Bam are related, however. Compare what we know about their upbringings. Tony, a hyperactive child. Bam, compelled to run into walls. It doesn't take a scholar to realize that the two have the same spark between them that remains consistent. The spark inside Tony that allows him to wield his board with the proficiency that he does exists within Bam as well. The problem arises from circumstances. There are forces outside their hands that lead Tony and Bam down completely different paths in life. Tony is a creature whose heart is naturally inclined to justice and goodness. His establishment of the Tony Hawk Foundation in 2002 is proof of that. Tony wants what's best for the world at large and for other skaters. However, in opposition of this, others are naturally tempted towards the forces of evil. Take Story Mainstay Officer Dick. His heart was good and kind at a young age, but relentless taunting from his friends allowed darkness to claim his heart and turn him into a dog for the law, a concept completely at odds with skateboarding. So where does Bam fall on the spectrum? Well, that's what makes him so dangerous. Bam is neither inclined to good or evil. His heart is completely unclouded by influence, and as such, he will fall in line with others' thoughts very easily. Should a strong heart of good or evil find Bam in this vulnerable state, it will not take long for their influences to take him over. At the moment, this is Bam Margera's tragedy. He has the potential to bring about the second golden age of skating like Tony had done. But without a force to keep him on the straight and narrow, he could also bring about the first age's ruin. That's why in the era of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, the only new skater recruited was Bam Margera to replace the recently fallen Bob Burnquist. Tony made it his top priority to allow Bam into his inner circle, as it would keep him from being tempted by dark forces. There are also reports of Doom Guy and Wolverine being there, but I think someone's just trying to mess with me at this point. For all of Tony's positives, he has a fatal blind spot which he is unaware of. As someone whose actions and thoughts are those of justice pure and simply, Tony of the Hawk is a very trusting individual who takes people's word at face value. When Bam gives his word to work with the Band of the Hawk, Tony allows him in with a questionable level of enthusiasm, prioritizing Bam's allegiance over all else. This continues over the course of the era of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4, where yet again, Tony has chosen to let no one else into his inner circle outside of those who remained from the previous era. His full attention is given to Bam to make sure he doesn't do something drastic. Despite his attention being placed squarely on Bam, he can't see the obvious. Bam is being used. To revisit a previous concept for a little bit, the Pantheon of Immortals is reserved for those who have proven themselves to be at the height of human achievement, those for whom their very being and their skill are one and the same. Surfing, wrestling, college hoops. If the body can be honed in order to reach the pinnacle of a field, then you can be granted the chance to join this prestigious group. But what about somebody who honed his body in a dark way? Not choosing to reach the top in his field in sports, but rather become the greatest at absorbing pain. In truth, there's some reality to the idea. You would have to hone your body to withstand any amount of pain, but is there any nobility or respect that can be earned from putting yourself through inhumane torture just for the sake of it? Where the pain is both the training, the sport, and the reward? One tried to answer this question, laying his life on the line to prove that you didn't need skill to become a legend. Johnny Knoxville. 
Once an ordinary human being like you or me, Knoxville wanted to attain the power of the Immortals more than anything. But seeing that so many shores were conquered before, decided to take a much different route to gain his power. He put his body through the most gruesome punishments it could endure. However, when he had reached the status of points that so many others had gained through his dark arts, he was rejected and shunted. Knoxville was seen as nothing more than a clown who didn't deserve a seat alongside the Immortals, who had carved their names into the stone of history the right way. But who were any of these people to say he did or didn't deserve it? He didn't do all of this to himself without reason! He now didn't want to join the Immortals. He wanted to tear down everything they were to the ground. With his power of points, Knoxville was able to bring together the dregs of society. He had found those who were deemed to be outcasts and unworthy of praise. Steve-O, Chris Pontius, Wee Man, David England. These were to be his unholy army meant to march against everything Tony had created. This was Jackass. However, what could possibly be better than plucking the crown jewel right out of Tony's helmet? That was Bam Margera. If he could convince Bam to join his renegades, then his revenge would be more than sound and fury. It would mean something. He would have what Tony couldn't. It was in seeing Bam brimming with the same energy that radiated off of Tony in their brief encounters that a new, even more devilish plan was hatched inside Knoxville's head. Why would he simply take Bam from Tony when Bam could take everything from Tony? Now that Bam had been exposed to an overwhelming evil to match Tony's goodness, he could leave that seed of evil within him to fester into something greater. This would be the greatest revenge he could have ever hoped for. What's better than beating the Hawk is to break the Hawk. Now that the thought of evil had entered the head of Bam, it could never ever be removed, no matter how hard Tony tried. The evil was planted in him from even before Tony and Bam first crossed paths, meaning that all of Tony's work to free Bam from evil was for naught, as it had already existed within him from the start. It cleverly lay dormant, not allowing itself to show until Tony had begun to slack. In 2003, Tony had begun to wind down his skating career in general, not just his professional days. But his skating days were coming to an end. That's when the bomb Knoxville had planted within BAM became set to burst. And when it did, mountains would move. We finally arrived, all caught up on the story! But heavens know that if you think the end is in sight, you've gone blind! Tony Hawk's Underground is the single most important piece of the story, and by extension the most important piece of human history, as it is the nexus point for our story. We follow you, the custom skater, who grew up in New Jersey, alongside Eric Sparrow. Just then, did you feel it? For those that felt a cold chill rocket down their spine, that's normal. Eric Sparrow is evil. I'm not saying he's an evil person, he is simply the concept of evil condensed into a small New Jersey boy. Eric is what every skater loathes, a heart with no space for good as it was filled with evil from the day he was born. There's no saying why, where it came from, or even how his frame is kept from exploding due to the pure concentration of bile in his system. Eric simply exists, and we have to deal with the ramifications of a creature like him choosing to become a skater. To quote one of the greater philosophers of our times, Xavier Nelson Jr., I've had the opportunity to write, and delete, a lot of hyperbole about Eric Sparrow while working on this article. I am not exaggerating when I say that I sometimes lay awake at night and consider the fact that Eric Sparrow will never go to hell, because he is not real and therefore cannot die. I don't know exactly what he means by that last part about him not being real. I have a picture of him right here, idiot philosopher. That's why you guys are tried for impiety and corruption of the youth. Anyway, Eric Sparrow and you are trying to become big time skateboarders, eyes bulging with imagined riches. Although Eric's imagination seems to be slightly larger than yours. After impressing the right people like Stacy Peralta and Chad Muska, you're gifted with a new board by your idols. And this begins the rift between you and Eric. Soon, however, drug dealers rob Stacy's store, and out of a childish revenge, Eric burns the dealer's place to the ground, causing him and by extension you to flee the state to escape being killed. 
From here, the story hits many of the same beats, with a the theme becoming clear of the lengths you're willing to go through to protect Eric, and how Eric would never do the same for you. In this, you see how when arriving in Miami, you have to work with the cops in order to save Eric from jail time, and are rewarded with Eric refusing to submit your application to a skate event, allowing himself to accrue points, letting him rocket past you in terms of power. The only reason that you can enter this event anyway is thanks to interference from Tony of the Hawk, who decides to step down from his U up high to right a wrong. This imparts a sense of love for the craft of skating onto you, one that will lead you to success or ruin. This rift grows further and further with every instance of you two meeting, and it's not until Hawaii that fate begins its final act. A trick is set up at the top of a hotel roof. Below you, a helicopter. Before you, a ramp. And inside of you, the same spark that Tony had. Tony knew you had potential, and could see your path forward was filled with vert ramps and grind spots all the way. His career is coming to an end. And with that, he sees you as the path towards the future. If you can clear this gap, skating will finally be in good hands, and Tony of the Hawk can rest. However, it was finally time for the bomb to go off, the one that Knoxville had planted so long ago. Tasked with recording the moment that skating would reach its zenith, Eric Sparrow does the unthinkable. With Bam's influence as strong in his heart as Tony's was in yours, Eric Sparrow steals the tape of you doing the trick and manages to pass it off as his own. This is the point of no return. What Tony saw as a moment to finally let go and let the next generation take the reins, Bam Margera saw as an opportunity to take that moment for himself. Eric Sparrow goes off to pass that tape off as his own and makes millions. He becomes a celebrity. He becomes a poser. Later on in Russia, Eric takes his antics far outside the realm of skateboarding and causes over $300,000 worth of damages to the Russian embassy and puts your life in danger. If it's not already obvious, you and Eric are tethered, much like Tony and Bam, except this relationship turned volatile far quicker than Tony and Bam's. That's thanks to Eric Sparrow's innate darkness. You two cannot escape your fated clash, and that occurs after you make it home and finally have a chance to throw down with Eric and get the tape back. However, this is not a battle between you and Eric. This is a battle between Tony and Bam. You're simply the horses they're betting on. Eric represents Bam's dark crusade to turn skating into some sort of sickly facsimile of what it really is, and you represent Tony's stalwart guard. You've built skating with your own hands, and to let Bam and by extension Knoxville destroy it would be to fail at everything you've ever stood for. They're simply imparting a little bit of their power into you to make things interesting. The battle is long and causes so much damage that only one thing could possibly end the conflict and the bloodshed from hurting any more innocent civilians. This is the Forbidden Skate Move, a variation upon the classic Christ Air, a move used to totally eliminate an opponent. Should it be used, nothing can stop the complete destruction of its target. Misuse of the move can result in total destruction of a surrounding area. To end the battle, one of you must use the Anti-Christ Air. I'd like to continue the story now, but Sadly, that's not up to me, where the story ends lands entirely in the hands of you and Eric. You see, I called this era the Nexus Point for a reason, for there isn't one ending to the story of Tony Hawk's Underground. Depending on how events play out, we find ourselves thrusted into different timelines depending on how the events play out. We've got a few different routes to tackle, so let's try to work our way back to the light. Sadly, that means we'll be starting in the timeline where Eric succeeds. He completely shatters your existence. You are but a fleeting memory in the minds of those that you made an impact on. And that gives Bam total power, allows him to defeat Tony of the Hawk, and by extension give Knoxville everything he's ever wanted. There are a few reasons to cover this timeline first, of all timelines, but mostly because its first installment is the direct follow-up of our previous adventure. Tony Hawk's Underground 2 is a world that instead of being bathed in the loving light of Tony of the Hawk, has been brazed in hellfire that Bam emits. 
In this take on events, Bam has become a wicked god in this universe, free to play with it however he sees fit. His worst tendencies have been allowed to run rampant like never before, and his childish attempts of deriving pleasure have left him in control of a world hanging on by a string at any given time. Seeing all the trouble that could be caused by a worldwide trip from the previous reality, Bam plots alongside a now servile Tony of the Hawk to create a world destruction tour where he can destroy new and exciting cultures at his leisure. As the story opens, we're shockingly back where we started in the previous timeline. A small-time Jersey skater and tolerant of the fact that Eric Sparrow isn't dead in a shallow grave. What's going on? Simply put, Bam liked things the way they were before everyone else got a chance to ruin his fun. To counteract this, and now with his own points merged with the ones he siphoned from Tony, he simply rewinded time to the events before everything happened, undoing your ability to stop anything that he does. This explains how both you and Eric could possibly exist at the same time in a post-underground world, despite one of you having to go. In a world more centered around Bam, we get introduced to another critical character in the Bam Margera story, Phil Margera. Phil is Bam's biological father, but moreover is the universe trying to course correct someone like Bam becoming so powerful all at once. Forces beyond our knowledge put Phil back into Bam's sights as an outlet for his aggression. If Bam has Phil to unload all of his hatred, rage, and childish energy onto, then perhaps more innocent lives could be spared. However, they place the burden of enduring the brunt of a nearly limitless energy being onto a single man, and there's only so much that can be done before Bam desires fresh meat. That's why he kidnapped so many innocent souls and Eric in order to hold his tour, placing Phil in charge of being team captain so such pedantic things like organization and planning don't have to fall on him. That's beneath him. He's just looking for an excuse to travel the globe and cause as much suffering as he can. And that love of suffering was imparted upon him by Knoxville and he plans on causing as much suffering as he can by the time the tour ends. That's why Knoxville, who's giddy to the point of giggling at the thought of other people suffering, even sends emissaries like Wee Man and Stevo in order to keep an eye on and report back to him how his plan is going forth. Not just his plan to spread pain as far as he can, but also to break the hawk. He may appear to be subservient to Bam, but in reality, Tony is fully able to make his own choices. Despite the harm that Bam is causing people, he still refuses to fight his friend again. He knows that killing Bam isn't the right answer. There's still good in him! Or at least Tony is delusional enough to believe so. Don't think this makes Tony innocent. He is still an accomplice to everything Bam pulls. He is the good man doing nothing, and it shreds away at his soul. Until eventually, Tony snaps and withers away into just a memory. Across the world, we get to see Bam ruin lives, destroy years-old monuments, and even betray those who have been loyal to him since the word go. This all culminates in your journey to the Mecca of Skating, their words not mine, because imagine saying that for real, Skate-topia. This is a skater's paradise, free from the judgment of the outside world, free from worries, troubles, nothing but skating exists here. That is, until Bam decides this world doesn't suit him anymore. In a violent fit of childish anger, Bam plans on destroying Skatopia, killing anybody foolish enough to be left in the blast zone when he blows up everything. It's while you're trying to escape the burning paradise that Bam delivers the most telling line in his character arc as to what kind of person he really is. Beautiful. My life finally has a meaning. These couple of words reveal everything about the Bam Margier we've known. A deeply troubled young man on the precipice of making a choice that will either save himself or ruin everything. Because of what Knoxville did to him, he can't see his life as anything other than a vassal to cause harm. He doesn't see a way out of such a path and accepts that it's not his want to cause harm, it's his meaning. The reason he exists is to hurt people. It's not his fault. 
This by association absolves him of all guilt he could ever feel. It's not because of him that he destroys. He's just playing out his part in life. And if that is to destroy, then he will destroy more than anyone's ever destroyed before. That includes destroying Tony. And that includes destroying time itself. Also, Phil Margera takes a poo on live TV. That's important too. In order to relive the greatest hide that destroying Skatopia gave Bam, he creates a fracture in an already broken timeline, creating the era of Tony Hawk's Underground 2 Remix, where Bam gets to reset time over and over, play out the same events in the same order because this is what normal should be to him. Wake up, burn everything to the ground, go to sleep, repeat. But this is only the beginning. While Bam can live out his life happily in this pocket of destruction, there's still the matter of Tony. Why force him to stay in a scenario with any hope that escape or even death will come for him? Knoxville planned that out long ago, and it was finally time to give Tony the death he deserved. He's not gonna kill Tony Hawk. He's going to kill skateboarding. That is the reality of Tony Hawk's ride and Tony Hawk's shred. Tony's ability to skate competently has been stripped from him, and from there, there's nowhere else to go. Tony, forced to ride despite hating the experience, that which once brought him the greatest of joy, now brought him endless sadness. He could never leave his board, forced to live out the rest of his immortal life in loathing of the very thing he created. Johnny Knoxville has won, Tony has been defeated, and soon the world will burn out. Nothing left except Bam, playing his fiddle while the world burns. But unlike Nero, he's not in it for the points. The next timeline that we have to delve into is one that may at first seem hopeful, but as we continue on, trust me, it will take turns. The timeline is reached when a standard victory is achieved by you over Eric, and you manage to destroy him. Bam's ties to Knoxville are weakened by the concept of evil itself being destroyed, and as a result, he can live amongst the people of this world in relative peace. After being played a fool to the point of endangering reality, however, Tony has become a recluse. This explains why in the American Wasteland era, he plays a bit part. He's created skating, and by this point, he doesn't care what happens to it. The events of the Underground Era have left Tony detached from the world he built, and now simply wishes to wash his hands of the whole thing and skate off into the sunset. This also explains why you, the player character, are choosing to move out to pastures new. Their best friend has betrayed them, and now it's time to be done with this chapter of your life. Without Tony's guidance, though, this leaves you to simp after a goth skater chick and try to create what would be Skatopia. Without the help of Tony, it seems like an impossible task, but somehow, through whatever little power Tony left in you from your battle with Eric, you managed to create somewhere that all skaters can call paradise. Back with Tony, however, he's coming to a startling realization that the road he's taking has no off ramps. All he can do is keep skating. Skate to. Where, exactly, though? Well, as it is described in the tomes, to find eight new skaters to form a new-aged band of the Hawk. Seeing as his old team was all but destroyed following Bam and Eric's defeat at the hands of you. The era of Project 8 is quite admittedly a skimmed over part of what is a much wider story of Tony of the Hawk, seeing as it's what comes next that shifts the story into Cataclysm. Ultimately, none of these eight are a suitable replacement for Tony as they all fail in one aspect or another. Apart, they're all good skaters, but none among them can lead skateboarding like Tony has. This can lead Tony down two different paths. If Tony accepts that skating's time has come to pass, he'll fall into madness. And in an attempt to capture what he once had, Tony will use all of his points to try and go back. Back to when things were simple, when skating was all about putting good into the world, not taking out the evil. This leads to the era of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD. The HD, of course, standing for hubris defeat, as Tony simply forgot a facet of humanity in reaching the peak of the species. Humans can never go back. We are creatures destined to move forward. And by rooting himself in the past, Tony has only allowed the evils of the world he now lives in to ruin his good memories. Now, Tony has essentially locked himself 
in a dream of his own making, with that dream every day creeping closer to an eternal nightmare. There is another way that this can go, however, as if Tony steals his resolve, we enter the Proving Grounds era, where the most shocking twist of our story is realized. Eric Sparrow is back. Evil never stays dead, and it seems Eric has chosen that as his life's motto. Eric's return is one of the most hotly contested pieces of the entire history of Tony of the Hawk, as by all accounts the Antichrist heir should have destroyed him entirely in this timeline. The only explanation that makes any sense and doesn't veer into heresy is that this can't be the same Eric that we all know and f***ing despise. What's far more likely is that something created a clone of Eric to take his place, explaining that while he may talk like Eric, he doesn't come close to matching him in most anything else like his appearance or even location. Even you, you of all people would be able to recognize Eric for all that he's put you through, but you do not treat him like the devil that he is. So what's happening? Well, consider the players that have left our game. Bam has been depowered to a tertiary character at this point, so the only explanation is that a wounded Knoxville has managed to use his dark points to create a fake Eric to torment you and Tony by reminding you of your failures. It can even be seen as he takes his time to plan it out since back in the Project 8 era, Eric appears as one of the skaters in the running to become one of the vaunted eight, notably at the bottom of the list, showing that his powers have been greatly diminished. This goes away to explain why Eric's in the form that he is right now, and why it's so much different from the Eric that we know. Knoxville has a very limited knowledge of what Eric even is, so to recreate him in any capacity would be a challenge. After you're able to weather the probing grounds, Tony finally realizes that you were always worthy of his mantle, and his trauma blinded him to the truth standing right in front of him. As the timeline ends, Tony retires to his own personal skatetopia. He allows himself to spend the rest of his life in a jam. A downhill jam. Downhill jam is about a dead Tony of the Hawk. There's still one last outcome to the story that has been unaccounted for, seeing that it's incredibly short and doesn't bear on any of the other ones, but the outcome itself is so unthinkable for it to be true, is almost unthinkable. But what if instead of the Antichrist heir killing Eric, the fight ended when Tony took matters into his own hands? Bam is going to hurt so many people. He's going to cause so much harm. He can't let that happen. Tony has to do something. He can't wait and wager the rest of reality on the actions of you. You're just a skater. He's Tony Hawk. It's his pro skater. He has to do something. And what he does is use the Antichrist air on Bam himself. He kills Bam. Tony has just taken a life, and not just any life, but a life that he held in such high regard as so full of potential in life that he created everything for him. He wanted to keep this life safe, and now that life no longer exists. Tony's hands are stained with blood, blood of somebody that he held in the highest regard. He disregarded the entire world just to make sure Bam could stay safe so Bam would not have to fall into darkness. And now, in trying to defend him, Tony has fallen to darkness. Everything in his life has always been done to keep people safe. And now he did something that could kill somebody. He killed somebody. What kind of monster would do something like this? He never wanted any of this. He just wanted this to be fun. And now he's a murderer. What could Tony possibly do to cope with this? And what he does is trying to escape from what he's done. He creates a new world. A world without Bam. And in doing such, he creates a time vortex that splits a fleeing Tony into realms that resemble his old home. The time Vortex was created by his attempt to escape his actions, and now he's forced to sit in those actions, in something called the Gamma Beta Paradox, or GB for short. 
This eventually evolves into the Gamma Beta Alpha Paradox when things start to get a little more isometric. Tony is confused as to why this is happening, but he eventually realizes that this is the universe's punishment for him killing Bam. He had all the power to change Bam's heart, he knew it, but instead he took the easy way out and removed Bam from the equation altogether. He drips from vortex to vortex until eventually landing in what seems to be his new home. But this, this is no paradise. This was his final punishment. Just like in the Bam Wins timeline, this is the final stop on his journey, where skateboarding ceases all fun. It's just close enough to his old home to remind him of what he's lost, but in such a way that he'll never be comfortable again. Unlike before, where Tony is withered into dust, Tony accepts that this is what he deserves. It's not his place to choose when people leave this world, no matter how many points he's earned. This is all the timelines that could possibly exist in the Tony of the Hawk story. It ends with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. And yet, none of them truly satisfy. There has to be some unifying factor to tie all these threads into one bow! But who could possibly ever do something like that? Who? 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 You. It was always you. Across every facet of Tony of the Hawk's world, you were the only thing that persisted. Even when Tony himself failed to show up in a meaningful capacity, you were always there. You are a universal constant. Between all of you is that same spark that Tony trusted you with back in Hawaii. The one that is going to carry skateboarding into a bright future. Tony knew you could, and if you want to make things right, you need to reunite with yourself. But which of you could possibly be up to the task? It sounds impossible since there's no way for you to get into another timeline. Not with your points. That's when help comes from the most unlikely of places. The you that can fix all of this, turn it all back to the way it's supposed to be, is the American Wasteland you. Why is that? Well, it turns out that even without Tony, you have somebody that can help you skip across the timelines as you run into one of the immortals from our pantheon. Matt Hoffman, professional BMX biker. Matt Hoffman can be found and will test your abilities with a bike as opposed to a skateboard. Impress him enough and there's no doubt he will become your ally and help you breach the timelines. By verting from one timeline to the next, you can reabsorb those fractured pieces of yourself to create the one ultimate you. The you that without Tony's help can take back everything that's been taken from you. One more vert and you are back where it all began. One final showdown with the Lord of Horror, Eric Sparrow, his dark master, Bam Margera, and the puppet master of misery, Johnny Knoxville. This time, instead of playing Bam's sick game, you take matters into your own hands for the first time and punch out Eric Sparrow, retrieving your tape, but more importantly, vanquishing evil from this world. Eric is defeated, Bam has been cleansed of his evil, and the dark soul of Johnny Knoxville has been vanquished forever. Now left with one path to go down, you, as the now High Skate Lord, decide that the world is going to be left in good hands, you want it to be Tony's hands. You revert the timeline back to the starting point of everything, and Tony, now aware of the evils of this world and ready to tackle them with a maturity he lacked before, enters the future. That leaves us with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. A chance to start over again. No more need for any more suffering. Just skate. That's what it's always been about. Just skate. So the games are uh, pretty fun. <laughs>